Welcome, welcome to this symposium, Scientific Evidence of Limited Worker. Just nu, jag har mikrofonen på här så jag stänger av den va? Ska vi se, och det har den är också precis, där det var det som ekar. Exakt, det var bra vi testade. Precis. Hallå, hallå. Hallå, 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 hallå. Hörs det någonting nu eller? Nej. Yeah. Ja. Welcome to the symposium scientific evidence of limited work up. Hör du någonting? Hörs det okej? Okay? Hörs det inte okej? Okay. Mm. Äckar det, eller du hör inte nu, nej. Äckar det fortfarande, eller är det är bättre så här kanske? Nu hörs det eko, eller är allting ok? Eko, ok. Scientific workup. Hallå, hallå. Hoppas det. Det är inte Peters dator då där bakom är. Hörs det något eko nu eller är det okej? Okay? Som inte var. Okej. Okay. Uh, är, no är, är ljudet okej okay nu så kan vi köra ju. Ge, ger du ut en signal?
Good morning and welcome to this uh, symposium of the Journal of Internal Medicine. Um, my name is Ulle Melander. I'm a professor of internal medicine at Lund University and adjunct editor uh, of the Journal of Internal Medicine. And I'm organizing this symposium together with uh, my colleague Frederick von Wovern, who will take over in a minute. Um, so the um, uh, title of this symposium is uh, Scientific Evidence of Limited Workup. When is too much, too much, and too little, too little? This is something that we believe is extremely timely. And um, we have um, the honor of having several internationally leading speakers who will um, uh, talk about this issue and be ready to discuss it with you. Um, uh, and I would like to, um, to, to again thank the Journal of Internal Medicine for um, um, organizing and uh, sponsoring this uh, symposium um, uh, of this important topic. And, and um, when uh, you in the audience, since we, we had for obvious pandemic reasons um, uh, changed this meeting to a hybrid meeting, meaning that it's mainly digital, uh, we are a few people here, but uh, less than eight. And uh, um, this means that uh, some of the communication uh, will uh, be had to be held by the chat function in Zoom. So any questions, and we, of course, uh, as original plan, we would really like to have this meeting as uh, interactive as possible. So whenever you have a question or a comment, so please uh, submit it through the chat function uh, of the Zoom. And we, uh, uh, Dr. von Wovern and I will, um, will uh, mediate the questions to the speakers um, after the talks. And I would like to start up uh, this meeting by saying a few words about the Journal of Internal Medicine. So uh, this uh, man, Professor Axel K., he was really the founder of the journal. And the Journal of Internal Medicine is actually the oldest Swedish medical journal. So uh, Axel K., he, he studied medicine. We are standing in Malmo uh, in southern Sweden. And Axel K., he studied medicine in, in Lund University, uh, very close to here, where he also wrote his doctoral thesis. Uh, then he was um, uh, he became he was uh, uh, became uh, promoted to professor at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, and later on he became also the rector of the Karolinska Institute. So the journal originally was called Medicinskt Arkiv and was founded in eight, 1863, and and changed name slightly in 1869 to. Nordisk Medicinskt Arkiv, followed by, uh, in 1901, Acta Medica Scandinavica, a journal that I think many of you have heard about. But in 1989, the, the journal got its current name, Journal of Internal Medicine. And um, you have the, the, the link to the journal uh, below. So. Um, this is um, 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 one of the um, um, uh, key internal medicine journals, and it, it publishes, GM publishes uh, anything from basic to clinical research, epidemiology, and trials within, as you can see in this schematic picture, anything from metabolism to rare diseases, aging, inflammation and so on. So uh, it really has the scope uh, that tightly links to the theme of this particular meeting that we are listening to today. 
I can also point out that, that the uh, uh, GIM has a very well-functioning um, system for handling submissions with an average of 12 days only from submission um, to a final decision and eight days to a first decision. Um, and and the, the, the average uh, time from submission to online publication is about 65 days. And it's of course indexed in PubMed, Scopus and, and the Web of Science. So, um, uh, Jim uh, organizes symposiums like this one. Um, and um, uh, and um, uh, has for the publications original articles, brief reports, research letters and reviews and perspectives. And uh, some of the talks of this meeting will appear uh, as reviews published in the Journal of Internal Medicine after the meeting uh, um, has ended. Um, and like the symposium day, Jim also have an interesting um, format of meetings called uh, Jim Think Tank. So uh, the the Jim Think Tank is is a um, way to support uh, researchers coming together to discuss and uh, uh, conclude uh, things about uh, single uh, important issues that maybe wouldn't be enough for a full symposium. So this is why I would like to lift this up. So typically a, a think tank uh, would be uh, about 10 participants and certainly within the, the interest area of the Journal of Internal Medicine and, um, and Jim would help uh, to organize and, and also to fund this meeting that is um, where the meaning is to, to get to conclusions, for example, to, to, to make consensus around some standard guidelines or to summarize the state of the art knowledge in, in a specific field and come up with a review on this. And, and um, so um, you can apply to arrange a think tank if you, if, if you are, uh, have a good idea and all the information about how to applying to arrange a think tank is on the uh, gym.se um, website. And uh, the journal publishes 12 uh, issues per year, once monthly. We get 1,800 uh, submissions per year. The acceptance rate is about 6% and the impact factor 6.87. And um, uh, all the review articles are open access and there is a hybrid option for the, for the original articles as well. R now, every, uh, we, we have to mention something about COVID-19 in these days. So for the past year, so GM received 854 submissions on research related to the COVID-19. And out of those 850 submissions, about 65, 70 have been published uh, in, in the journal. And in fact, one of those was early on something that we today uh, know and all believe is a, is a, is a very well-established fact about taste and, and smell sensation uh, problems. And this was published very early on uh, uh, as one of the first publications of this phenomenon related to COVID-19 in the Journal of Internal Medicine. So, uh, and the, the editor-in-chief is uh, Professor Ulf de Fer, and uh, Jim has a physical editorial office at um, Karolinska Institute in, in Stockholm in Sweden. And um, as I said before, for any information, including thoughts about arranging a think tag or anything related, you will find everything summarized under gym.se. With these words, I, I'm going to, to, to uh, leave over to my colleague uh, uh, Frederick von Wovrend to have an introduction to, uh, to this meeting. And um, um, Frederick is a um, um, 
consultant of internal medicine. He's also um, the president of the Swedish uh, Society of Internal Medicine and is working really, really hard on this issue. And Frederick was the initiative taker for, for uh, this uh, meeting. So uh, I'd like to leave the word over to you, Frederick. Please. Thank you very much. So I'll take the clicker. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And you forgot to mention that I'm actually also your boss. So, so, <laughs> uh, so uh, I would like to extend my gratitude to the Journal of Internal Medicine for letting us have this very important symposia uh, and letting us in the Swedish Society of Internal Medicine to be part of it. Uh, we would all hope to have had this meeting uh, in real life, but due to the pandemic, that is not an option, obviously. Uh, these are the, uh, the time slots that we will take you through today. Uh, all speakers have about 40 minutes where we have prepared 30 minutes of talk and 10 minutes for discussion. So we would like to urge you all to uh, ask questions via the chat function and me and Ulle will try to sum it all up and ask questions to the speakers. Uh, I will have a brief introduction now to the topics. And then my colleague from Iceland, Dr. Ranafel Paulson, will continue and so forth uh, all through the uh, e uh, afternoon where we've had, we have a little bit of a change where Ziad Obermeyer is having the last talk and Rita Redberg the second last talk due to time uh, differences in the U.S. And then we have two more talks tomorrow. Now, why are we here? Well. One of the obvious reasons why we are having this symposia is that we have a cost inflation regarding to healthcare spending. Uh, this is true probably for all countries in the world with very few exceptions, that from the beginning of the 1980s up until now, healthcare expenditure as uh, depicted as a percentage of GDP has almost doubled. Uh, the U.S., of course, is leading the way with huge spendings, maybe not getting all the, that they could have gotten out of health care. But this is also true for most other Western countries. And the black bar in the middle depicts the Swedish expenditure for 2013, where we spent about 11.5% of our GDP on health care. Now, one should keep in mind that every percentage that you spend on health care is something that you don't spend on something else. So you should make it worth your while to really think about what are we actually spending on. Not just money, but also patient suffering, time, and allocation of resources. So we just start the picture there. I have a little bit of a milk uh, an animation. Oh, it doesn't start, let's skip that. So what are we actually trying to discuss is when it comes to cost, there is a problem built into the system that the economic growth, which finances all healthcare, whether or not you have tax, taxation and universal healthcare, or a insurance-based system, the economic growth in society needs to meet the increase of annual cost of healthcare. Otherwise, there will be a discrepancy. And throughout the Western world, the discrepancy is just continuing to grow. In Sweden, we have an increase of the annual cost of healthcare at about 5%. Some of that is due to wages of personnel working in the hospitals, but also costly treatments such as CAR T cell treatment or other advanced cancer cells treatment. This drives up the cost and has to be met by economic growth. When it comes to patients, and what, what do we do with the patients? Do we harm them? Do we do good? Well. We as doctors are taught to try to evaluate the patient's situation, try to find out what can we answer this patient's question regarding to health. Are there any tests? If not this test, maybe some other test. But this is also a way of thinking where we maybe we go in the wrong end of things. Uh, we have a tendency not to ask questions. What happens if we don't do this? And in the bottom line, it, whatever, whatever we do, there's a patient in the bottom line. And the patient has to deal with the physical harm of what we do with them, the cost for society, uh, displacement effects for other patients, 
and perhaps we're not doing anything good, but, but we should not do anything bad for the patients. Now this is a little bit of a humoristic taking, taking on if you go to a hospital today or a primary care physician. And I would like to provoke you a little bit to say that this is not so far from the truth. If a patient is coming to a hospital in Sweden or perhaps some other country, you're meeting a doctor and there's a great chance that even though the doctor is quite certain that the patient is suffering from one condition, you want to be sure that they're not suffering from something else as well. And that leads to excessive tests, diagnostics, over-treatment. And that, in the best case scenario, that does not harm the patient, but it most certainly will drive up the cost and will, will give that patient less uh, benefit from other uh, examinations. And, or, and of course, other patients will not be able to, to take, uh, take um, uh, part and, and uh, to be, uh, well, the bottom line, don't do too much testing. Why are we doing this diagnostic testing? Well, there are some theories. If you ask a senior doctor, they're always blaming the junior doctors. If you're, if you're asking the junior doctors, they're always blaming the senior doctors. I'm not getting supervision. Well, I'm not giving supervision. There are guidelines, but the guidelines do not apply. I do not know. The patient expects. Patient, patient expectations. We're going to hear a little bit of that uh, later this afternoon. What do the patients really want? Do we ask them? Do we have enough time? Does testing, is that a surrogate for not having enough time for the patients? Do we fear legal problems? All these things lead to excessive testing and treatment. Sometimes we're very interested of a condition. I know some colleagues, me, myself included, sometimes there's something very interesting and I want to, to, uh, to investigate. Maybe that's not in the patient's interest, but it's in my, my interest. And that has, be t has to be taken into account. Now there are major challenges ahead. And I think today and tomorrow will answer some questions and they will rise some other questions. We have an increasing population in almost all nations in Europe. These populations are beca becoming older. And this is very true also for those countries in Europe we, which have a negative population increase, such as the eastern countries in Bulgaria and Romania. Those populations are begin beginning to get very old because the younger individuals are leaving those countries for other countries. There is an unchanged or a reduced financial support for healthcare, and th there's a competition. <coughs> excuse me, competition for those resources when it comes to school, roads, other types of uh, civic and national interests in having an infrastructure to support your population. N not everything can go to healthcare. The cost of healthcare per individual in the elderly is much higher than in the younger uh, individuals. So by having an aging population, cost will increase. And there is also increasing expectations on healthcare. Now, 2021, post-COVID, we, we're going to have the possibility to treat diseases that we did not before. Cystic fibrosis, uh, difficult cancers, all that will lead to expectations. And Every time that there has been a new uh, treatment for a, for a disease that, was, that used to be untreatable, that expands to other nearby lying uh, diseases. So for the CAR T cells treatment, for example, that will probably spill over to other, other diseases, and that will lead to increased expenditure. So there is no magic solution for this. No, uh, there's nobody coming from the outside and telling us, what to do and solving our problem. I think doctors need to be involved in solving the problem and not just playing stray aside. Now the Choosing Wisely initiative has been firmly established in the US for the last 12 to 15 years and it has spread around the world and in Europe as a tool to minimize uh, low value care and try to 
disregard and, and dismiss treatments or tests that doesn't uh, pertain for something for the patient. And the four questions that are really important to ask when we try to apply the, the uh, choosing wisely strategy is, do I really need to prescribe this test or treatment? How often do we really ask ourselves this question? Everything is done by routine or almost. I'm a little bit provocative here now. What are the side effects and risks of this treatment? What happens if I don't do anything? What will happen to the patient? And are there other options that I could try before I go down this road of excessive diagnostics and over treatment? So these four questions can really lead the way for us forward and reduce cost and unnecessary suffering for the patients. And one way to do it is to try to just rule out five things that we already know that we should not do. Five do nots or five donuts. I don't know, maybe you could call it what you want, but five things can easily be put, put together and just, just agree on not doing it. And that will lead to a mind, uh, a state of mind and a way of thinking that will actually benefit in other questions. So by that, I would like to conclude my introduction and I would like to uh, urge you all to ask questions via the chat uh, and me and Ulle will try to sum it all together and ask the questions to the speakers. Uh, we're going to have uh, a lunch break and a coffee break and I think uh, everybody uh, at home can stand up and do whatever. This is one of the benefits of a Zoom conference of course. Uh, and me and Ulle will be standing here all day, getting tired in our legs. And uh, so, uh, so just do not feel shy, and we would like to have an interactive session here. So ask as many questions as you possibly can. I know that all these speakers are very keen on, on answering questions, and we'd like to have a discussion. So, and I can see that uh, Ronald Fur is uh, hooked up to the internet from Iceland. So, are you ready to go, Ranulfur? Yes, I am. Yes? Okay, so let's uh, start then. I, uh, I would like to introduce the next speaker, which is Ranulfur Paulson, who is a professor of medicine and director of medicine in Reykjavik. Uh, used to be the chairman of the European Federation of Internal Medicine and also the Icelandic Internal Medicine Federation. Very esteemed and uh, Ronofo has worked a lot on educational uh, uh, tasks in, within the European uh, Federation of Internal Medicine and is one of the authors of the curriculum of the internal medicine throughout Europe. So with no further ado, the stage is yours, Ronofo. Thank you very much, Frederick. And uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this very interesting Symposium. Now, I will uh, uh, focus today uh, on hospital medicine. I think, uh, as you outlined, Frederick, I mean, I think we as, as clinicians, I mean, we, we have to change our ways, but we also have to look at our systems, systems of practice inside and outside the hospital setting. And, uh, you know, we, we are, we base our, our approach very much on, on a long tradition. And I think we are uh, quite conservative when it comes to changes. I'm going to talk today uh, about the um, situation that is uh, happening in many, in many countries. Uh, it varies from place to place or from hospital to hospital. Uh, certainly in Iceland, it, uh, my presentation today will reflect uh, our experience here, although I will in my presentation draw uh, um, very much from published data mostly from the UK, from the United Kingdom, because a lot of work has taken place uh, in the last uh, uh, one or two decades. Now, I have no disclosures. <clears throat> uh, I think the, the uh, pandemic has uh, really highlighted the importance of managing multimorbidity and the value of the generalist, the generalist approach to patient care. And certainly uh, internists, internal medicine physicians have been instrumental in the care of individuals uh, uh, with COVID-19. Now, <clears throat> there are multiple challenges that are 
uh, facing acute care hospitals today. Uh, there's increasing need for uh, acute medical admissions. There's shortage of beds. In many hospitals uh, around the world, uh, uh, the, the number of beds were, were reduced, was reduced uh, uh, in the beginning of, the, of this century. Uh, I think mostly to, uh, to uh, in, in order to contain costs and, and, and I believe that uh, uh, we could increasingly manage the patients in the outpatient settings. But unfortunately, this has backfired uh, for many hospitals uh, because there are now flow problems and access blocks for uh, admissions. The, the profile of hospital inpatients has also changed. Um, the, the, you know, the characteristic patient today in medical wards is an elderly person with multimorbidity. There are geriatric problems, including frailty and cognitive impairment, and polypharmacy. Uh, another issue that I think is, is important is, uh, is the care has become kind of fragmented. It may be largely due to uh, uh, the, heavily, the heavy emphasis on specialization, which has driven uh, obviously advances in medical care, but may not necessarily be the best approach uh, to manage patients in the hospital today. There are growing demands uh, for high quality services uh, among the public, and of course, finance, you know, financial challenges and staff shortages. Now, while uh, you know, life expectancy obviously has increased very much <clears throat> in, in developed countries. <clears throat> and in, in the past century, I, this was mostly due to improved living conditions. But in recent decades, I think advances in biomedical research and innovation has generated new pharmacologic therapies and, techn and technology have altered the course of many devastating diseases, adding to the uh, life expectancy of people today. And just to name uh, a, a, a few <clears throat> conditions, vascular diseases, cancer, of course, HIV infection, which is now a chronic disease, uh, hepatitis C, and, 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 and a number of rare monogenic diseases. And the treatments are generally very extensive. Now, if we look at the, if, if we think that the, that the situation is difficult today in many hospitals, although I, again, it, it varies from, from hospital to hospital, I mean, it, it, it will definitely become a lot more difficult in coming years. Here we can look at the, at the demographics of the uh, European population in 2019 uh, and, and the projected population in 2050. And the filled bars represent the current, the 2019 population and the outlined bars, the, project, the projected population in 2050. And what you can see is that the elderly population will increase substantially and in people above the age of 85, above the age of 80 will double in numbers. But unfortunately, the uh, population that contributes uh, income to our societies will shrink at the same time. So this is clearly uh, a sort of a pessimistic uh, uh, situation, and and I think that uh, if we think if we think that we are okay today, we are not going to be uh, in a good state tomorrow. Now, th these are administrative data from the kingdom and, and showing emergency admissions through the emergency department, A and E department, in the period 2003 to 2016, and what you can see. And these are obviously millions of admissions. What you can see is that while the uh, 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 visits to the emergency departments increased over this period, about 18%, admissions through the major uh, uh, emergency department increased by 65%. And at the same time, elective admissions increased as well. Now, and, and the, the proportion of emergency admissions uh, that uh, where individuals with underlying chronic conditions uh, is also uh, interesting because this is the relative change in the same period, 2003 to 2016, while the uh, while individuals with uh, one or two uh, with zero or one uh, chronic condition remained relatively stable, 
there was a, a, a marked increase of about 200% of uh, people with two or more chronic conditions. So this reflects the, uh, the profile of patients that we have in the hospital today. Now this cartoon shows a situation that is becoming common in emergency departments uh, uh, all over the, the Western world is we have overcrowding of patients. And the reason is that, you know, there's a, a shortage of beds, of hospital beds and access blocks. So this has consequences, including uh, obviously uh, reduced quality of care and basically uh, jeopardizing uh, patient safety. And, the, and, and sometimes surgery has to be canceled because yeah, there's a need to open up hospital beds. And unfortunately, this is putting a lot of strain on the, on, on the staff, not only in the emergency department, but also in the front line, uh, you know, from various departments in the hospital and, uh, and resulting in, in burnout and so on. Now, why is, are we, are we seeing this emergent overcrowding? Well, this is high patient volume and shortness of bed, as I have alluded to, increased the incidence and complexity of acute illness, so that the resulting in more admissions and more complex admissions, shortness of medical staff during nights and weekends. We have to remember that the regular working hours are only about 24% uh, of, uh, of, the, of the week. So uh, the majority of the time is after hours. And, and frequently we have limited staff. And when we have increased volume of work, I mean, it's, it's inevitable that things become difficult. Insufficient diagnostic services out of hours, in, inadequate resources for management of, of discharging patients. There's paucity of alternative care models for urgent care, and I will I will uh, uh, discuss that a bit uh, later in this lecture. And lack of public education about usage of emergency services. Uh, now, another issue I want to bring up is our mortality rates according to the weekday of admission. And this, these are data from Eng uh, England and Wales, 2004 and 2012, these are administrative data. And we have here uh, about uh, uh, 14 million admissions in, in England and about a million admissions in Wales. And uh, the, these data were, age, were standardized to age and sex. And what you can see that the uh, admissions on, on Sundays had the highest mortality rates been uh, 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 introduced in the past on a number of occasions. But uh, and here we have a, uh, a systematic review of about 68 studies around the world, although the majority from the uh, UK and, and, and the USA, uh, basically showing uh, uh, the weekend effect of hospital admissions and the pooled estimate the pooled estimate uh, showed about a increase in the odds of death for those who were admitted uh, to the hospital on a, uh, on a weekend. Now, uh, countries uh, and hospitals have, have attempted to respond to these increasing challenges that I have uh, presented. In the United States, I, I, you're all aware of the hospitalist uh, movement. I mean, most of the uh, most of the demands on the hospitals and healthcare systems are uh, medical uh, uh, patients, patients that require internal medicine uh, care or, 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 or specialties of, of inter related to internal medicine. And in the United States, um, uh, and specialists in, in, in consultants and specialties related to internal medicine. They manage patients both in the office and they're responsible for their care hospital. But this uh, uh, became uh, uh, difficult and, and, and basically didn't work anymore because of the uh, heavy load uh, of, of work uh, in the hospital. And the, uh, there were also funding issues and, and it resulted in the um, hospitalist movement uh, that started in 1996 and has uh, grown tremendously ever since. And uh, now 
uh, more than 95% of hospitals in the United States that have 200 beds or more have a hospitalist program. And the, the number of hospitalists in the States is more than 60,000. And these are internal medicine physicians that are basically focused on hospital medicine. But there are downsides to this in, in my view because uh, their services, the hospital services are kind to patients, uh, uh, to inpatients. They don't do much outpatient work. And, and that has an impact on continuity of care and, and, and may uh, result in uh, problems associated with trans Now, uh, in Europe, uh, things vary in Europe, and we believe that there was a lot of variation. We know, you know, the Southern European countries, Northern European countries, there is substantial differences in how internal medicine is practiced. So uh, the European Board of Internal Medicine, which is a joint venture of the European Federation of Internal Medicine, or EFIM, and the UEMS section of internal medicine, UEMS, the specialist organization uh, 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 placed in Brussels, is uh, this joint venture, the European Board of Internal Medicine, a survey about a decade ago, a survey on the practice of internal medicine in Europe and postgraduate education in internal medicine in Europe. And, the, and the, the, the aim was to get a picture of how internal medicine is practiced and how training is, is carried out uh, throughout Europe. And the, the results were quite interesting. For all there was a lot of similarities, even more so than differences. Uh, and and there, that's no surprise. But there were some differences in eight countries the majority of internists practiced only internal medicine. And, and this is mostly the Southern European countries like uh, Spain, Portugal, uh, not uh, listed among these eight, uh, Greece, but also France and Germany. In eight countries, 30 to 50% of internists practiced internal medicine and another specialty. And this is common in the, in the Northern Europe. And that, I think in, 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 in many cases, a lot of the focus is on the specialty, whereas the, the internal medicine practice is more out of need. Now, the majority of internists all over Europe are hospital-based. Uh, however, in, in Germany, Greece, Poland, Switzerland, uh, uh, at least half of the internists intern practice exclusively in the office setting. So there are certain differences, but I think what we learned is that the difference between the southern part and northern part of you exists, whereas a lot of, of a lot more uh, specialty uh, uh, focus in, in northern Europe. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about the impact of specialization and subspecialization and even sub subspecialization in internal medicine. And, and although we, of course, know that specialization has driven advances in, in biomedical. Uh, research and, and, and in patient care, uh, there are also downsides. And, and a lot of uh, articles have been written about uh, this problem of super specialization uh, uh, and, and the impact or the influence on modern medicine. Now, the, uh, um, within the European Federation of Internal Medicine, uh, there's a group of young internists, that is, and, and this group, has been quite active in recent years, has grown, grown significantly and has been an important, is an important uh, part of the organization. The young internists carried out a uh, study uh, more than 10, a little over 10 years ago, uh, looking at diagnosis in internal medicine department in Europe. And I think there were 18 European countries and uh, about 1500 cases. And basically what the results showed is that it's a, there's a relatively limited number of conditions that are predominant in internal, de internal medicine department and, 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 and the 25 that were uh, the sort of principal diagnosis uh, in these patients. And this basically tells us that, that in, in acute hospital medicine, I mean, the, the most common uh, conditions are, are limited in numbers. Now, in the United Kingdom, there has been a response, a significant response to, to the uh, developments that I, that I described. Uh, it, a new specialty was developed uh, within internal medicine, 
uh, in 2006, I think, I, I believe, named acute medicine or acute internal medicine. It's a hospital specialty concerned with assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of adult patients with urgent medical needs. It was formally recognized as a specialty in the UK in the night. Now, uh, associated with this is the development of the acute medical unit. A medical unit, this, in, the, in the acute medical unit, the acute physician focuses on, on the acutely ill uh, medical patient and basically covering the first 48 uh, hours uh, generally uh, of admission. Nevertheless, Significant problems occurred in hospitals uh, across the, uh, the UK uh, in, in the last, should I say, 15, 20 years, culminating uh, in almost a breakdown uh, that resulted uh, in this report by the Royal College of Physicians uh, named Hospitals on the Edge, Time for Action. And there was action. Uh, this future hospital concept was developed for caring uh, for medical patients uh, by the uh, Royal College and there was this future hospital commission that did the work and a lot of interesting uh, 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 solutions uh, are presented in this report. Now, in essence, the, the medical division uh, is responsible of, for overseeing care of all acutely ill medical patients. We have the patient in the center. It's a patient-centered approach. You can see that in, the, in, this, in this circle, the patient is in the center. Then we have uh, the acute care hub, which has basically includes the uh, acute medical unit, providing assessment and initial management of acutely ill patients for the first 48 hours overseen by acute care uh, coordinator. We have here on this side, we have the hospital-based medical division, and here we have the community practice. And, and one of the goals is to bridge the inpatient care. And, and, and some of it has to do with sheer responsibility, including integrated care where specialty care is provided in the community. Now there's uh, uh, very much emphasis on clinical coordination, with, with real-time data on patients and, and data on capacity and resources within the hospital constantly looked at. Now, what is the impact on, on such uh, approach uh, on hospital mortality, other outcome measures, uh, length of stay, and so on? There have been a number of studies, but studies have been quite weak based on retrospective studies based on administrative data, but have generally shown a short, uh, shortened uh, length of stay. But uh, in terms of mortality or other significant outcome measures, uh, the uh, 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 results have been more conflicting. Now, this is a study from uh, Ireland, from the, uh, James's, from the James's Hospital in, in Dublin, uh, basically looking at a, a five, five years after a change was made. 2002 was the reference uh, year, and, and then they looked at the, uh, the four years after that, looking at mortality, for instance. And uh, uh, here you have the, uh, uh, over, uh, the all-cost mortality over the five-year period, and it basically it showed a 44% uh, uh, reduction in mortality over the five-year period. And looking at 30-day mortality, the results were similar, about 36% uh, reduction in mortality. And the median length of stay decreased from seven to five days. So here we have at least one study uh, uh, clearly showing the uh, benefits of, of, of the, uh, the uh, acute medicine, acute medical unit approach. Now, similar experience uh, uh, has been occurring, uh, has been basically presented from the Netherlands. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, it was decided to uh, 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 to take on the acute medicine approach and establish acute medical units. It's it, it, not all the hospitals in the country uh, have a, an acute medical unit today, but many of them, and you can see the increase in the in the number of uh, acute medical units in the country uh, from 2000 to 2016. In Australia, New Zealand, 
And in, in many other countries, uh, trends in these directions uh, are now occurring. Now, in my view, uh, we need to uh, come up with new strategies for efficient delivery of acute care. It has to do with organizational services. And we have to design the organization based on patients' needs. Seven-day hospital with sufficient weekend house staff and consultant coverage, and a proper balance between general and specialized in telemedicine services. We still need the specialized services and, 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 and clinical pathways for specialty care. But in terms of uh, simple problems, uh, and, and uh, unselected problems, uh, general internal medicine, I think, is, is the best approach. Should be ample access to geriatric expertise, which frequently is part of the general uh, internal medicine service, early senior physician involvement, timely decision making, focus on early diagnosis, in and promoting patient safety and quality of care uh, have to be in place. And here's how I see the organization of hospital medicine services with uh, internal medicine as the centerpiece, coordinating uh, the, the care of the, uh, and then all the specialties bran branching out from this centerpiece. Now, another thing, which I think is very important is to, is to come up with alternatives to, alternatives to inpatient care for the acutely ill uh, uh, patient. And the, um, uh, within European, the European Federation of Internal Medicine, we have a, uh, professional Issues and Quality of Care Working Group has been quite active, and they published this report on hospital ambulatory medicine, uh, focusing uh, on different aspects of ambulatory care, but including uh, urgent care or emergency ambulatory care. But there are all kinds of alternatives that are possible, uh, anywhere from uh, quick diagnosis units uh, to daycare hospitals, the hospitals uh, hospital at home, uh, subacute care, post-acute care, and so forth and so on. And, and I am quite uh, uh, interested in this uh, ambulatory emergency care. And in fact, here at, 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 my, at the University Hospital in Reykjavik, I mean, to, uh, in dealing with the pandemic, we used this model uh, 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 predominantly uh, for seeing acutely ill patients with COVID-19 uh, prior to deciding whether they required hospitalization. Now, same-day urgent care is a, is, a, is a very good alternative to emergency department visits for many conditions. Suitable for patients with a range of acute medical conditions that can be treated. And, 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 and this can be uh, asthma, uh, anemia, uh, even uh, chest pain in some cases, uh, even... Uh, 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 lower gastrointestinal bleeding in a hemodynamically uh, uh, stable patient. There's so many, many, many different conditions that frequently end up in the emergency department. Ready access to common diagnostic tests, close collaboration with specialty teams is very important. And the goal is to reduce the number of unnecessary emergency department visits and hospital admissions. Now, we need to train uh, physicians, internists uh, uh, in, in a new sort of model of, of care. Uh, and uh, the, the European Board of Internal Medicine created the European curriculum in, uh, that was uh, completed, I believe, in late 2016 and was officially published in 2018. And uh, in this curriculum, we address general the need for generalist care uh, uh, in, in, a, in a much greater uh, proportion than we have had in the, in the past uh, uh, decades, at least in Northern Europe. There is uh, three scenarios for training in internal medicine. Uh, we have uh, uh, internal medicine training and qualification as an internist, five years uh, uh, a minimum. And obviously this is our competence-based uh, curriculum. Training in internal medicine uh, and another specialty with, uh, with qualification in both. And according to the European framework, uh, uh, the total uh, number of years for, for dual uh, certification is not five years in, in, uh, in internal medicine and five years in the specialty. There is uh, some overlap there. So I think most uh, people can, can complete this in seven or eight years. Now, and then finally, for those who embark on a specialty related to internal medicine alone, a common trunk, a basic training in internal medicine uh, is presented uh, for those individuals. 
And here I listed the, some of the specific domains of expertise in, in the curriculum, uh, uh, largely focused on hospital medicine, multimorbidity and aging, acute care, uh, medical consultation, shared decision-making, collaborative care, transition of care, vulnerable adult, patient safety and quality of care and medical leadership, all very important domains of the practicing internist and internal medicine specialist. Now, we need to maintain our bedside skills. Uh, and, and there is a real threat today with the sort of, a, uh, you know, the, the, the basically the electronic uh, revolution that has impacted heavily on, on the way we spent our time in the hospital ward. Uh, and, and obviously the technological uh, advances, uh, you know, that, that provide, uh, 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 you know, all kinds of uh, tests and test results that we can use. But still, the bedside skills are important and not the least in terms of uh, sort of uh, 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 rational use of resources. But there are also uh, opportunities, even at the bedside, uh, in terms of technological advances in internal medicine. And this is the bedside ultrasound, which uh, is becoming very popular in many countries and is very useful. And uh, at the European Federation of Internal Medicine, we have, we have advocated for this in the last few years and, and, and uh, provided workshops and so on. Another thing is the, is the, is the ward rounds, hospital ward rounds. And this is, a, is heavily based on traditions, but there are many, many opportunities to, uh, 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 for improvements in, in the way we, we do the work rounds. And um, uh, this is a report uh, from the United Kingdom, the Royal College of Physicians and Royal College of Nursing collaborated on this. Uh, the modern ward rounds and, and the key principle is leadership, structure, effective teamwork, patient involvement, and educational learning and improvement. And I, I urge you to, to look at this because there, even if we think that, you know, the, that we are doing the ward round uh, in, in the best possible way, I mean, there are always uh, opportunities for improvement. Now, handover of information is becoming more and more uh, frequent between, uh, within the team, between the, uh, the on-call team and the ward team and so on. Uh, to, uh, during transition, and this has uh, been shown as the, uh, the, the, the biggest risk of medical error. And uh, so in many countries, the, there's been a, a, an emphasis, uh, increased emphasis on how we do the handover. And uh, it has to be done in a structured way uh, using data, real data. And we need to spend time on it to do it properly. And, and, and this, uh, here we, we see a, a results of a study, a multi-center study in the United States uh, that basically looked at uh, uh, medical errors uh, uh, after implementing uh, a structured hand, uh, handover system. And we first looked at the uh, overall medical errors uh, uh, before implementation and after implementation. There was uh, about 44% uh, I'm sorry, there was about 23% reduction in overall medical errors and pre preventable medical uh, adverse events and uh, about 30% reduction. And looking at the, uh, uh, in the figure on the right, looking at the percentage of oral handoffs that included key data elements at all sites combined. You can see the light green bars are before intervention and, and the, green, the dark green bars after intervention. And you can see that there was a significant increase in a, a provision of data elements on illness severity assessment, patient summary, to-do lists, contingency plans, and, and, and read back. So, so this is a, an area where I think we, we, we should definitely uh, focus on. Now, uh, as I alluded to earlier, in, in particularly trainees uh, uh, in, 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 in medical specialties, in telemedicine in particular, they spend a lot of time on the computer. And there's a, a not at the bedside. And, and this is a, a study that was carried out in Switzerland a few years ago. Uh, there were 36 uh, internal medicine residents with about 30 months of postgraduate training and they documented their activities uh, over a three month period. And what did this, uh, this study show? 
activities indirectly related to patients accounted for 52.4 percent of, of the time and activities directly related to patients to 28 percent of the time and residents internal medicine residents spent an average of 1.7 hours with patients 5.2 hours using computers and 13 minutes in doing both and, and obviously we need to to uh, find solutions to this and I mean, we need to spend a lot more uh, sort of uh, focus on uh, value-based documentation, uh, documenting uh, valuable information. We also need to uh, come up with uh, digital solutions that uh, make this work more, much more efficient. Voice recognition, templates, uh, uh, mobile applications. And we are in the, uh, we are part of the digital revolution and we need to uh, somehow make use of, of, of uh, 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 advances in clinical care in communication with patients. And uh, in the, for the NHS, uh, Eric Topol, the American cardiologist was asked to uh, lead uh, work on how to prepare the healthcare workforce to deliver uh, the digital future. And this is a very interesting report and, uh, and I recommend uh, that you read that. Now, I, I think uh, I've come to the uh, end of this uh, lecture and I think it's quite fitting to uh, uh, leave you with this quote of uh, Sir William Osler, that good doctors take care of diseases while great doctors take care of patients. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so thank you very much, Ron. Uh, always a pleasure hearing you talk and a very holistic uh, description of both uh, the problems and also the possibilities of future internal medicine and also for, for the entire healthcare system, I would, I would say. Uh, so we're gonna start off with some questions. So Ulla, do you have a question? Th thanks a lot, Renault, for a great talk. I, I have a question on um, um, the, the role of randomized clinical trials in this increasing patient category. Obviously, you, you demonstrated very well that this, um, uh, people with more than uh, two diseases are, are contributing maybe the most to hospitalizations now and not to mention the future. So. My question is, and, and um, uh, do you see um, um, uh, do you see randomized randomized trials coming in, in and not necessarily drug trials, but it could be that too, of course. But as uh, I think today, th this patient category is never included in randomized trials because the GFR is too low, or or some of the diseases are are, are contraindicated for the drug tested. So. So my qu and, and I think, uh, I mean, <laughs> obviously, personally, I think that m more of the resources should be allocated in this area. And, and um, since now, for the latest years, there are also large tr trials that are not sponsored by pharma. So where do you see this coming in? And, and what do you think are like the most important endpoints in that case? a very important question and I wish that I had a good answer to it because you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, this is a group that is very difficult to study. Um, as much as I value uh, the clinical trial, I mean, there is clearly, in my view, an increasing gap uh, between evidence-based medicine and real clinical practice because we just don't have uh, the adequate uh, trial information to base our decisions on. And this group of, of patients that are sort of uh, uh, becoming dominant in, in our hospitals and, and in our medical system is, is, is difficult to study. I mean, I think we have to come up with, with other ways, uh, but we definitely need to study the outcome. And, and this brings up another, I think, important point that comes to mind related to this, and that's prognostication to, to determine a prognosis because I, I mean we spent a lot of of efforts and funding on caring for patients in the last year of life for instance in the hospital setting very elderly individuals with multiple problems but we have a we still have a difficult very difficult time coming up with a uh, 
a good enough uh, prognosis so that we can actually decide whether to uh, carry on with with the major interventions even or therapies or or not at all so i wish i had an i mean i think we have to take a very close look at this and obviously this whole whole area of precision medicine is now coming up with different ways to uh, to basically test uh, uh, different treatments even based on single patients and so on but i, I this is a, this is an area that i think is going to be very important in the coming years hmm. thank you so could I ask you a little bit of a perhaps a provocative question? Uh, you uh, you alluded to, uh, just as Ulla said, uh, that most patients that are actually admitted to the hospitals are multimorbid elderly patients, and at least in Sweden, the uh, the uh, the education of doctors and uh, the the specialties that doctors seem to uh, linger towards are not the ones that are taking care of those patients. So do you think that us as doctors have a larger responsibility to actually try to turn the, uh, the structure of healthcare around a little bit? Because as I see it, at least in Sweden, we have a, a huge amount of doctors, but most of them are not really interested in, in taking care of multimorbid elderly. Absolutely, Frederick. I mean, I think this is, this is you know, this is uh, probably the most important sort of uh, area of decision making for the future of medicine and healthcare that we need to uh, uh, address. I mean, I think, you know, the, uh, uh, I can envision that when you come up with a, a, a change in, in, in an operational structure that like they have in the UK, the USA, and now uh, embarking on in the Netherlands, and, and we have the experience from Australia and New Zealand, more and more young physicians become interested in, in just practicing insular medicine or acute medicine. But it will never be enough, uh, or at least for years to come, particularly in the Northern European countries where, where the sort of interest of physicians is really uh, in the uh, sort of more uh, specialization in medicine. And unfortunately, this results in that, you know, no, we've, you know we all know that we frequently you know, we, 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 we approach different specialties with, with patients and they feel that the patients are best uh, suited for somebody else. And you get that re response from everybody. So, so what, what, what can you do? I mean, and then some people say, well, elderly people should be cared for by geriatricians. But I mean, we only have a few geriatricians. So this is basically the, the, the typical medical patient. So we have to come up with ways to, to uh, uh, address this. And I think in my view, and this is why we uh, designed the uh, internal medicine curriculum, uh, not only for, for just pure internal medicine, but also for those who are interested in becoming uh, specialists also in, uh, in, in related specialties, is that those specialists, they will also have to practice internal medicine. There is no other way. So I think, you know, we people, obviously, they, I mean, they can choose, the, you, know, uh, the, you know, the specialty they're interested in for their career, but if it's a specialty related to internal medicine, they have to train and practice general medicine as well. I cannot see any other way uh, mm -hmm. for the future, and this is only going to get worse, as you can, you know, as you can. I'm sure you can see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think we have a inherent responsibility as doctors to to take care of all patients, and and we have to be held accountable for the skills that we've been taught. So uh, to the benefit for all patients, of course. And, and Frederick, and if you do it properly, and if you come up with a strong system of care and, and, and you know, the ward teams, you know, they all practice in the same way, using the same methods and so on. I'm, I'm sure this can be fun, mm. uh, you know, and, and I think the experience from countries that have embarked on this, I mean, you know, more and more young phys physicians, internists, they become in interested in a career like that. Of course. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ronald, for uh, we're going to move forward in the program. Hope everything is okay in Reykjavik. Uh, and we're going to move down south to Milan and invite uh, Dr. and Professor Nicola Montano uh, to, as our next speaker. Uh, Nicola is a professor of internal medicine at the University of Milan. Uh, and he is uh, also past president of the European Federation of Internal Medicine. 
Uh, and I hope that you have very nice weather in Milan, because here in Malmö it's uh, raining and it's not very nice. So, welcome, Nicola. Thank you very much, Frederick. Good morning, everybody. Unfortunately, is, uh, it's raining also in Milan. <laughs> <laughs> usually, but usually it rains one, one day per year, and this is the day, and so it's good. So it's better, because let me tell you that I envy you a lot, because I would rather prefer to stay, uh, to stand and have all my legs tired than risk gluteal muscle thrombosis, <laughs> stay sit here for the old day. So uh, let me first of all thank you and, uh, and uh, Professor uh, Melander and uh, the Journal of Internal Medicine for having said this very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting workshop. Um, just, you know, briefly, I think that the last point that you touched with Ronald for the problem of, of generalism, it's real, would be a cornerstone because all what we are talking today it needs a cultural change and is based mostly on a cultural approach. Hmm. So it takes time, but I think that the pandemic showed very clearly that uh, this is a moment in which we have to recover a generalistic view beside the specialistic one. They are not alternative, but they are complementary. And without a generalistic approach, would be less efficient to have a, a, um, a strong specialization. Sorry, just just to you know to to um, to, to to complete. Okay, so um, let me share my 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 talk. So today, the topic, uh, you know, after the healthcare system and all the. You know, the characteristics uh, uh, and the change in the healthcare system that we should need. Uh, my topic is related to our profession and the Choosing Wisely initiative. Uh, let's go straight to what is the Choosing Wisely. The Choosing Wisely initiative is uh, started uh, back uh, in uh, more or less 10 years ago. And the mission uh, was to promote conversation between clinicians and patients by helping patients choose care. So first of all, a relationship between the, the physicians and the patient. So uh, this conversation should have aimed to choose the care that was supported by evidence, not duplicative of other tests or procedure, free from harm and truly necessary. Uh, excuse me, uh, Nicola. Uh, I don't think your screen is being shared right now. Uh, I'm sorry. So I'm sorry. So I'm not sharing. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now everything is okay. There. Good. Is it okay? Yes. Thank you. Okay, as, uh, as uh, I told you, okay, this is the mission of the choosing wisely. And so, you know, the American Board of Internal Medicine back in, 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 uh, in 2012 launched this, uh, this initiative and uh, um, recommending the, 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 so the scientific society to produce list, the top five list, uh, what not to do. So I think it's very important uh, to understand what is the context of this, what we are talking about, why it's important uh, for us and for our profession to establish this relationship. Because if we consider the determinant of health population, as you can see, the medical care is only a, a small part of the, of the overall cake. And, and we know very well right now that, uh, you know, beside the personal um, and uh, personal factors and what medical care can really uh, be effective in. There are behavioral uh, strategies, genes, and socioeconomic factors who are really important. So we are talking about the medical care and our focus is patient safety. And we have to always to take in mind that the is, is our primary outcome, patient safety. 
and why not to start from this uh, uh, you know this motto is primum non nocere first no harm that was attributed to thomas seidman in the 60s but you know he actually wrote that is you know this was back from uh, from the latin era so and i would like to start with a very simple clinical case uh, uh, a real case uh, which uh, happened uh, which occurred in my hospital and to one of my collaborators recently a few months ago there was a female 46 years old affected by systemic sclerosis who is followed by our by our uh, outpatient clinic that was admitted to the emergency department for appeal nephritis she had fever increased white cell counts lumbar pain so within the emergency room, uh, a ciprofloxacin uh, IV was started. She was maintained uh, uh, under observation for 24 hours. Uh, the patient felt much better, had no fever, and then was discharged. The day after, 24 hours later, she came back to the emergency room for <clears throat> complaining about pain uh, at the level of anticubital vein on the site of intravenous access. So the patient showed the modest signs of inflammation. And since an ultrasound device was available, the emergency physician on duty decided to do an echo scan. The exam showed the superficial vein thrombosis. A consultation call was made to a thrombosis specialist who suggested from the Parnux 5 milligram and scheduled a visit for the next day. And so the, you know, the patient went back home and the next morning the patient came back to the emergency department uh, complaining for an headache, a cerebral hemorrhage was diagnosed. And maybe I hope that you agree that sometimes doing more not always means doing better. Okay, so this was, of course, you know, uh, and this is something that was, uh, and we have many, many examples like this during our clinical uh, practice. So let's talk about our current paradigms in the, in the daily practice. So this has been uh, provided me courtesy by Rita Regber, who will deliver a talk in uh, this afternoon. And I, we can, uh, say that she is one of the founder of the old choosing wisely and the less is more movement. So the current paradigms are that if some medical care is good, more care is better. Newer technology is always better than the older technology. Getting a medical test can't hurt. And the prevention is about getting the right test at the right time. And I hope that during, uh, you know, during my talk, uh, I can convince you that these uh, paradigms uh, have to be shifted. Otherwise, we will, you know, continue having the grow in a iatrogenic disease and in the cost uh, that uh, Frederick and showed us at the beginning, at the introduction of this meeting. So let's start from screen. A few examples. This is um, a, a paper uh, which came out a few years ago on New England talking about uh, the relation between screening and overdiagnosis. And they talk about the, the example of the thyroid cancer epidemic in Korea. Korea, uh, which is a, a highly technological country, started in 1999 a large screening uh, uh, in the general population for breast cancer, thyroid cancer, and, and colon cancer. And these are the data. So what you expect, and you can see that, you know, that the, 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 there was a, a huge incidence, um, an increase in the, in the incidence of the, of the diagnosis of thyroid cancer in, uh, in Korea. Uh, these are the data from 2008, 2009. And of course, this was associated with a huge increase in total thyrectomy or uh, submaximal uh, sub uh, um, uh, thyroidectomy. So what we expect uh, by a screening, 
a screening should uh, detect early sign of, of a tumor and then the removal or the treatment of this tumor early should reduce the mortality. If you look on, on, the, on, on the right picture, you can clearly see that the increase in the rate um, in the rate of diagnosis in the population was not associated to any change in the mortality who stayed absolutely the same. So the message from the study was to the overall, uh, you know, by the author was to the overall world, be careful uh, because you can screen, you can diagnose, but this diagnosis cannot be associated with a real reduction in mortality. And so this is uh, uh, an alarm because this means that we are over diagnosing and over treating our patients. The same for the use in the general population uh, of undiscriminated uh, uh, assessment of the prostate uh, um, antigen. Uh, and this is a study that was performed, that was published in JAMA three years ago, in which uh, it clearly showed up why the use of PSI screening intervention and standard and standardized diagnostic pathway was totally unrelated with the mortality at 10 years ago. So the use of PSA in this way was not associated with a real uh, um, uh, increase, a reduction in, uh, in mortality due to prostate cancer. And it's nice because I found this uh, uh, on the New York Times uh, this uh, uh, comment by uh, Richard Ablin. Richard Ablin is a research professor of immunobiology and pathology at University of Arizona, and basically is the person who uh, discovered the, the, the PSA. And he wrote that, uh, you know, I never dreamed that my discovery four decades ago would lead to such a profit-driven public health disaster. The medical community must confront reality and stop the inappropriate use of PSA screening. Doing so would have saved billions of dollars and rescued millions of men from unnecessary debilitating treatments, said from the person who actually discovered, I think it has such an impact. And just to stay on the general public, uh, on the general, uh, uh, let's say, uh, public literature, uh, and the New York Times published three days ago, last week uh, this article by Ronnie Rabin talking about breast cancer centers, huge annual scans uh, counted to as guidelines. And she highlighted the fact that although the American guidelines, the US guidelines, would suggest starting the, the annual mammography at 50 years. Uh, hundreds of centers are telling women 40 up to come early. So there was this, 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 this difference. And there was a comment that I just discovered yesterday, you know, from the comments published in the New York Times of this Daniel B. Of course, we don't know who is, and but I, it's just because this is one of the, you know, of, of the problems that we are facing. And Daniel B. wrote from Chicago as a practicing breast oncologist with a degree in medical management, I can assure you that the recommendations are financially driven. Even the data is interpreted to create the impression that is about science and care for patients. The reality is that the creation of a breast center is invariably linked to the generation of revenue streams to pay for facilities, high tech equipment and, and its staff. If they are not profitable, they close regardless of any recommendation. Whatever we like it or not, there is always a bottom line in the delivery of healthcare in this country. Of course, this is limited and is just, it's just to introduce one of the important uh, confounding factor in screening, which is of course a conflict of interest that also uh, Frederick underlined before. And if you look, for instance, at the International Cancer Screening Recommendation for the general population, this is a very nice paper published a few years ago by Bell in Public Health Freebies. You see uh, here 
the breast cancer mammography and you know uh, in different country there is I would say an agreement in starting the the screening uh, between 50 uh, up to 50 years but you know and there are a lot of uh, differences uh, in countries not to talk about the the screening in general population with the PSA there are uh, countries in which they are not recommended at all in all stages, other in which is recommended. So there is still a lot of work to do and there is no general consensus yet to reach. This is the last, uh, one of the last report published uh, two months ago by the World Health Organization on the cardiovascular screening programs. Uh, you know that the, these, the, these uh, authors concluded that there is no evidence for reduction in mortality or morbidity following the, the screening and the, the cardiovascular screening program, which are ongoing, even though still there are a few ongoing, we don't have the results. So the message must be clear. Screening are crucial, are fundamental, but still we don't have the, again, the right tool or we have done, still don't have the right strategy and the shared strategy for most of them. Wasteful is the association, you know, that if we use a lot of resources for screening, of course, what the risk is also that we waste money beside the fact that we expose our patient to a risk. And these are the data from the European uh, Clinical uh, and Observatory uh, um, uh, by Mark Pearson published back in 2017. These are some data from the UK. For every 10,000 British women aged 50 invited to the screening for the next 20 years, there will be 43 deaths from breast cancer that will be prevented. However, 20, 120 uh, nine cases will be overdiagnosed and treated. And this, of course, will increase also the course for adverse event, hospital acquired infection. So uh, there is a cost that we pay. The inappropriate, these are a few other examples, the inappropriate use of antibiotics by uh, type of health care service that is high, especially in general practice. And we know how much the inappropriate use of antibiotics uh, is driven now the antibi antibiotic resistant uh, pandemic. That is the pandemic that will stay after this will hopefully uh, finish soon. Uh, again, the hospital admission for chronic condition are often av uh, avoidable. And so this is another source uh, of uh, of risk for the patient and the waste of, uh, of uh, uh, cost. So we are ordering more service. We are ordering more tests. We are ordering more imaging. These are the two fields <clears throat> in which, you know, inappropriateness can be more. Uh, and so now we need a paradigm shift. And so, and I uh, have to thank uh, again Rita. I modify slide to air, uh, another of her slide. So prevention so far is founded, should be founded on lifestyle choices and, and public health measures, diet, nutrition, activity level, so exercise and sleep, not smoking, not, you, not abusing of alcohol, Medical care needs should be tailored for the right test or treatment for the right patient at the right time. And we should discuss patient risk and benefit with our patient. We have also to remember that almost all care has benefits and risk. Every single drug has side effects. And so every drug, every treatment may have a side effects uh, that uh, could be really detrimental for our health. And if these tests and treatments has no known benefit, no risk is acceptable. So we have to move and toward this paradigm shift. So we need the cultural change. So, you know, the context to change a little bit, not first do not arm, but do not net arm 
because we will always be and we will also face a cost-benefit uh, balance. Uh, and so this is our new goal. And so this is the reason why less is more campaign, too much medicine, the choosing wisely are growing in popularity and are growing in interest uh, in, uh, you know, uh, transversally in all uh, specialization, but mostly in internal medicine. Uh, because the overdiagnosis, overtreatment are common in our daily practice, more common than we can really expect. And this is uh, um, a, a nice editorial by Broderson published uh, on the British Medical Journey Evidence Based Medicine. When you say, now let's summarize why there is too much medicine, because of too much screening of asymptomatic individual, not later than Friday, I received in my three patients in my outpatient clinic, uh, in my private practice, and all the three of them were, you know, professionals, uh, um, highly cultured individual who asked me for checkup. Because there was, uh, and I asked them, what is the problem, what you are worried about, nothing but i would like to do you know i would like to test my my heart and would like to be tested for you know possible and so i told her uh, so what about the screening that uh, you know that the um, the, the, the national level you know we are doing but we need more i want to do more more exams so and it was quite a while you know to discuss with them and to say that the undiscriminated checkup tests so, so to perform a test without a question, without a signal, without a sign, uh, outside of any screening strategy is really uh, is not worth. And so too much investigation of those with symptoms, sometimes just because of symptoms, we, we do too much reliance on biomarkers, too many quasi disease, too much diagnosis often leading to too much treatment, and this has to do, you know, uh, we can discuss for, for, for days the fact that in our guidelines, often, you know, the levels for considering uh, a disease, a pre-disease or a disease change. I remember when the new guidelines for hypertension came out four years ago, you know, I, before the, they were published at night in US, so, I went to bed and I was normal tensive, but I woke up. When I woke up, the, the, you know, the limit was lower, so I became an hypertensive subject. Uh, we have to take care, we are too many adverse reaction and the iatrogenic, uh, iatrogenic disease uh, are a problem. And too much healthcare sometimes implies too little effective healthcare. So this is something that we have to address. And actually, 1936 wrote, medical science has made such tremendous progress that there is hardly a healthy human left. So why not to do is difficult because, you know, not to do or to talk with the patient, try to, it's uh, much more difficult than to do because for our self-esteem, for the trust of patient, family, colleagues, collaborators, for economic reasons. So these are the reasons which when someone comes to me and say, I would like to perform this, you know, I had a, a, young, a, a young woman, 20 years old, with a history of syncopal events, neuromediated syncopal events, vasovagal, but she, she believed she had something in her head uh, or a tumor and she asked for a TC scan. I said, no, you, and, you know, she searched for other physician until someone provided with a prescription and she got uh, TC scan, of course, was, was negative. Uh, sometimes not to do is difficult for the patient, for the system, and, uh, but we have tried to, to resist. And we have to remember that, of course, every choice implies a renunciation. Uh, and so this makes the things more difficult for us. But this is, uh, you know, this is our paper in our, our um, that we publish our position paper of the European Federation of Internal Medicine on, uh, on less is more. So 
you know, why are the diagnostics are overused? Because the patient-physician interaction, interaction sometimes lack of communication, which are shared decision-making. And from one side, the physician, there could be a lack of knowledge, lack of trust in evidence-based medicine, cognitive bias. We may have financial or other uh, pernicious incentives from our, of our side. From the other side, the patient may have expectation, can be worried. Um, there could be definition of inappropriateness, can be really difficult sometimes to to get, there could be a lack of monitoring, all this together uh, induce an overuse and uh, um, are related to overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Uh, you know, and I, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing, uh, um, hearing, uh, hearing the next, uh, um, the next uh, um, speaker talking about uh, uh, of talking about the, the quality of, of uh, evidence, but we know that when we um, um, when we take and we consider guidelines, the quality of evidence in clinical guidelines may be quite low. And so, you know, why why guidelines? I just just this just is a, is a paper we published a few years ago because there is the guide that there is an e in ideal world and real world, and uh, and I'm really looking forward to hear the next talk uh, talk on this. And so I don't want to spend too much time, but uh, uh, this is uh, something that we rely on, but we have to be quite sometimes skeptical, and we have always to look inside the guide to see what is the real um, evidence, uh, that re the real strength of the evidence. So we are coming back here to the choosing wisely, less is more. And uh, um, I think that this is the, uh, a real important uh, uh, movement and uh, which uh, a very strong impact. And this, as you can see, started uh, uh, and, and it now spread all over the world, as also uh, Frederick showed. And we at AFIN launched the Choosing Wisely working group and uh, with 26 countries participating. And we published uh, last year this uh, perspective paper and you know, our conclusion is this, and there is a substantial overuse of some common procedure demonstrate no benefit and present potential harm in everyday practice. Compelling evidence based on several studies and summarized in different practical guidelines demonstrate that this waste can be minimized in our healthcare system. Cost saving should be not the primary goal of less is more medicine. Though it can be a collateral effect, the pressure to reduce cost is beneficial when it coverage, when it converge with the patient's health interest and serve to improve medical quality as part of a sustainable global economy. So this is our main. Our main goal is not cost saving. Cost saving is a, is a, is a collateral effect of uh, um, maximizing the, the the beneficial. And I would like you. Know, to finish with this. So you know we have to. This is uh, is from I think is from from Norway. It's a commercial that I found very interesting because it really has to do with uh, you know with uh, uh, what we do. So uh, it's very important, and uh, I think this is my my closing message. Uh, 
is really, really important, uh, uh, and this is a cultural change, that we approach um, the talks with our patient based on the evidence and based on uh, really on uh, what can be safe. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for this great talk with a lot of eye-opening thoughts, I think, here. So I, 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 um, I'd like to start off with a question for you, which is, uh, I mean, obviously, and uh, you demonstrated very clear, uh, trying to embrace the entire population or at least the population over a certain age with some screening like PSA or, or, or uh, mammography or uh, what it be, is extremely difficult. And, um, and in the case of cardiovascular prevention, I think, uh, um, as you pointed out, that trying to um, identify some uh, you know, segments which, have, which would expect to have a higher risk where screening would be beneficial on, on risk factor intervention <coughs> or risk factor measurement and, in, and intervention would make sense and would do good, but not in, in unselected populations. So, and I think in, 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 in the scenario of cardiovascular primary prevention, uh, the, this, is di this is slightly different because you, you can trace some uh, disturbances in, in, uh, in, in your physiology years before disease, whereas this is more difficult in cancer that uh, more or less doesn't come gradually, but That's more uh, happens. So my, my question is then, <laughs> how do we do to do the, th that kind of, 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 of cancer screening in the right way without applying other biomarkers to like find a subset where, where let's say mammography would be indicated? Or are you saying that um, uh, you should await other clinical symptoms before you start to do the, 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 the for example, mammography? So wh where do you see this? this line drawn? Uh, uh, thank you very much, Frederick. This is, uh, this is the real core question. Because of course, you know, the data that I showed, uh, they would not suggest not to do tests, not to screen. The problem is that for the knowledge that we have, uh, we should be careful because there are uh, a lot of uh, studies. You know, there is the Swiss study on uh, mammography screening published on JAMA a couple of years ago, clearly showed that uh, uh, you know if you use a very like if you unselect the women that you uh, may miss a lot of uh, a lot of uh, um, a lot of cancer, while if you focus more, you are a higher chance to have an early diagnosis, and you know the, the literature is full of this. So the fact is that we should, uh, I think that uh, still we need more consensus and uh, more data in trying to select uh, the, the population under study. So it's not, uh, uh, you know, is the, there are three patterns. So it's the right time for the right population, the right test. So these three. I think that the screening are fundamental, are crucial, absolutely. What we still need is a, a sort of refinement and uh, in order to be more efficient, because of course, uh, as I told you, uh, you know, that the, the, there are a lot of study and we didn't have the time for, uh, for instance, lung cancer. You know, there are a lot of overdiagnosis uh, of a single no uh, lung nodule because now the TC scan, for instance, has increased so much the resolution that uh, a small uh, nodule that were not even accounted years ago now, now they are, uh, they are taking into account their screen. So think about this. Think about uh, a TC scan 
for any reason, the tuberphone and the reason nodule. And the physician asked, okay, come back in six months. How could you live those six months? Thinking, you know, knowing that this could be, uh, could develop from that. So it's a real difficult balance. We need, we need absolutely, uh, we need uh, to early diagnosis, and, but it's a balance. It's a balance and a continuous refinement, in my opinion. So we have to maybe reduce the mass uh, screening and focus much more because otherwise, you know, we can get for sure those um, early uh, cancer, but we can even overdiagnose and so overtreat the patient. So it's a, it's a real difficult balance. It is a continuous development. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, is very important. This is a very important uh, part of research. Still, we don't have the right, uh, the you know, right answer for all the for all the screening. So the indiscriminate screening doesn't work. We totally agree with you there. Uh, I have a question about uh, implementation of a choosing wisely strategy. It might seem very easy uh, and uh, intuitively and intellectually, this is a, a done deal to me. But there are many analogies to describe the difficulties, one of which is it's hard to teach old dogs how to do new tricks. Uh, I mean, we try to come up with strategies to change the way we work, the way we think, but culture does not die out so easily. So what are, what are the main obstacles, do you think, while trying to implement a choosing wisely strategy? Because a lot of those things that we already know that we shouldn't do, we keep on doing. Uh, Freddie, we had just said, is a cultural problem. Mm. Uh, let me give you this example. In the, the, on the Canadian Journal of Internal Medicine, a couple of years ago, they published a study. And, uh, you know, after the choosing wisely on uh, the prescription of antibiotics in upper airways infection, okay, where you should provide uh, antibiotics only if you have a positive swab. And so they made a study in which they, you know, they, they collected data in the um, family physician, in the family physician group, that all they were aware of the choosing wise strategy. But then they, you know, the problem is that mm. they had to deal with uh, a mother of a 14 or, uh, years old guy with uh, <laughs> fever, throat, that, and she was really, really worried about you know, many of them provided antibiotics even in absence of the real. So what does it mean? The, 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 the fact is that um, a cultural change is the longest change in terms of application. Because I think the only possibility to have is, is, is if we start from our university, from, you know, um, from the students, and teaching to our student a different strategy in order to sometimes to resist, you know, to, you know, it's very difficult. I think it's very, I, I'm not a pediatrician, but if I, if I was, I think it would be very difficult to resist to, you know, to a mother that is anxious because the, uh, as a son, uh, 10 years old with a fever, and say, why don't you prescribe me an antibiotic? Well, you know, it's very, very difficult mm. to, to resist to this. And uh, myself, I'm not a pediatrician, I'm not a general, so I don't know, uh, but it, it would be equal. So it's really, this needs a slow and continuous education to this. And uh, we cannot really make, you know, a switch, it's like to switch, okay, from today we will not, prescribe any more, uh, you know, antibiotics uh, if we don't have uh, uh, the positive uh, swab test or it would be impossible. But, you know, to put in the young generation, to put in young physician, the idea that this is the way, I think is the only, as you said, 
This is a cultural problem, is a cultural shift, and the cultural shift, as you know, takes a lot of time. Yeah. So the important thing is to talk and continue to talk. Now, for instance, I put in my, I teach to the students of the last year in, in uh, of, um, of the graduation in, in uh, at the medical school, and I have two lessons on uh, choosing wisely. And any time I, 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 I can, I use, you know, and I try to have the setup of what we can do here in terms of deciding wisely what to do for our patient. Mm. But I think it's a very long process. It's okay. a cultural process, and the cultural process takes a long time. But it's very nice that, for instance, we have... Uh, we have symposia like this yeah. because this is means that these are it, it's arriving and now is becoming more and more uh, important or relevant for the general practice. Exactly. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, Ulle? Thank you so much. Um, I think we we uh, need to move on to the next lecture. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Montana, and. Um, uh, we 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 go to um, uh, I'm calling for uh, Dr. Mina Johansson, uh, and uh, Mina she is a, um, a family physician specialist of family medicine. She's uh, director of Cochrane Sustainable Healthcare and a, a researcher at uh, Cochrane Sweden, and. Uh, Mina, you will um, cover a subject that is really uh, right on the spot for this meeting, whether guidelines are guiding us right. Uh, so uh, please, uh, Mina. Yeah, many thanks, Ole, and many thanks for inviting me to uh, give this presentation. It's a true priv privilege to be uh, one of the presenters on a list with so many distinguished uh, speakers. As Ole said, I work half-time as a family physician in Uddevalla, a small town on the Swedish west coast, and I work half-time as a researcher at Cochrane Sweden and as the director of Cochrane Sustainable Healthcare. And the title I was given for this talk, Are Guidelines Really Guiding Us Right? Um, I think the short answer to that question is no, but that would be a rather boring talk, so I will make it a little bit more complicated. As a theme for this presentation, I chose this background picture uh, which is a reference to the streetlight effect. And the streetlight effect is when we look for our keys in the cone of light from the, from the streetlight, even though we drop them in the dark. And I think that is a metaphor that is not only relevant for guidelines, but also for evidence med medicine and medical science at large. And I will get back uh, to what I mean with that later on. First, I have uh, no financial conflicts of interest. I'm paid only by my clinical employer and a grant from Forte, which is a governmental uh, research funding agency in Sweden. I think it's fair to say though that my perspective is colored by the fact that I'm a general practitioner. Uh, I was so pleased to hear um, Ronaldo and Nicholas uh, talk about the importance of generalists' uh, perspective in, in medicine today. It's, it warms my heart. <laughs> Uh, and also that I work for, for Cochrane. So this is a study where uh, in, a, in of a population in a geographical region in Norway. So in this region, they have measured basically everything uh, on the whole adult population. So and and put all this collated all this data into a database. And the authors of this study, they applied the evidence based European uh, guidelines on cardiovascular disease prevention to this population, um, to this database. And they found that according to the guidelines, over 80% of the uh, adult population were uh, judged as in need of medical attention, which means that they should see their, their GP. Um, and what's interesting is that only 3.9%, the green in the upper left corner, uh, were considered according to the guidelines to have a normal cardiovascular disease risk everyone else had an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So this is obviously like a medical artifact, especially since this is one of the uh, healthiest and most long living populations in the world. The authors also um, 
estimated the consequences for the healthcare system if the recommendations of the guidelines were followed. And they found that to treat only hypertension, according to the guidelines, 99 uh, GPs per 100,000 adults would be needed. The problem is that in this region, there are only 87 GPs per 100,000 adults uh, today. This means that if these evidence-based guidelines for cardiovascular risk were, were followed, the healthcare system would, would crash. Uh, even if all GPs used all of their time to treat only hypertension, we would still not be able to do it according to, to guidelines, uh, and we would not have time to, do, to take care of any other illness or disease uh, in the population. I want to stress that I am not saying that we should not treat hypertension. I, on the contrary, I believe that's an important part of my work as a GP, so that's not what I'm saying. But clearly, we have a problem here. Uh, guidelines are supposed to help us, clinicians and patients, to prioritize uh, financial and human resources and to decide what to do. But currently, they're not doing a very good job uh, on that. And hypertension is only one of so many conditions and problems that we face in, in primary care. Imagine what happens if, if we would do this study on all uh, recommendations in, in all guidelines. Uh, it would be something like this, I think. Uh, this, is, um, this picture pretty much sums up how I feel an average day in my practice. It's like a constant tsunami of uh, evidence-based recommendations sometimes or often tied to financial incentives um, with absolutely no possibility for me to do more than a few percentages of the recommendations. So how do I choose which recommendations to follow? Uh, the problem is that when there's such a massive mismatch between what is being recommended and the available resources to provide the recommendations, what is done becomes arbitrary and uh, most often we end up providing interventions with limited benefit to populations with a rather low uh, risk, while we don't have time uh, for the interventions with larger proven benefits for populations with greater risk. And that is not only unethical, it's also irrational from a public health per per perspective because it, make, it makes our healthcare systems inefficient and full of waste. And I also believe that this is a major reason to physician burnout. It's not so easy to work in a tsunami. <laughs> and I, this, I, think, I think it's good to just kind of stop and think about this because it's, it's, uh, it, this is really a big thing. Uh, I mean, the, the recommendations in guidelines is not off by 10% or 50%. They are off by hundreds of percent. They're so, it's so way off. So to say, uh, I think, it's time for all parts of the evidence ecosystem to take an increased responsibility for this uh, major issue that puts both patients and, and clinicians into a very difficult situation. Uh, because this tsunami uh, is not only a problem for physician, of course, it's, it's perhaps, or definitely more importantly, a huge problem for many patients. The term treatment burdens was introduced by Carl May, Victor Montori, and Francis Mayer in 2009. Um, and they argued that the burden of illness has its counterpart in the burden of treatment, uh, which is the workload delegated to the patients by health uh, professionals, such as uh, self-care, self-monitoring, managing therapeutic re regimens, side effects from pharmaceuticals or other treatments, organizing doctor visits, tests, and insurance. Um, and many patients with chronic disease are overwhelmed by this tsunami. Uh, and we often respond by calling them non-compliant uh, when they don't fulfill it and do everything that we tell them to do. And I believe that that term non-compliant is a very telling example of the medical arrogance that we uh, currently are working in, in, in this paradigm. And as they argue in this, in this paper, treatment burden is an aspect that should arguably be included in medical, in medical guideline, guidelines, but it very rarely is. As a side note, I would like to take the opportunity to recommend the work of Victor Montori uh, and the rest of the team at the care unit at Mayo Clinic uh, for, in the US. Uh, for example, this book, Why We Revolt, uh, which I don't think you would regret uh, reading. So I sound maybe a bit critical to, to guidelines, um, but I, 
I want to say that I mean I'm I'm obvious that I think there is no hesitance that evidence-based my guide evidence-based medicine and guidelines are absolutely vital uh, for medicine today um, but there are lots of dark clouds on on the sky and um, in this picture the road is 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 the guidelines it's a little bit tacky but yeah and then there's lots of dark clouds uh, in the sky and the first one being inability to prioritize resources both human and financial for both patients and the healthcare healthcare system so how could this happen uh, i don't think you have to be very paranoid to believe that vested interests uh, has played a role uh, in this study they looked at guideline panels that decide on cutoffs for, for different diagnoses. Um, as you know, the uh, cutoffs for, for a, very, a huge amount of diagnosis within medicine has been lowered and lowered and lowered the, during the last decades. That's true for, for risk factors like hypertension and, and diabetes and osteoporosis and stuff like that. But it's also true for symptomatic diseases like asthma and de depression and polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, IBS and, and so on. Um, so uh, the, these authors looked at the, the ties to pharmaceutical industry from, uh, from these guideline panels, and they found that 10 of 16 panels lowered cutoff, uh, although, although none considered potential harms of the lowered cutoff, not to patients in form of overdiagnosis and overtreatment, and not to the healthcare system uh, or the society at large in, in terms of opportunity costs. 75% of the experts had ties to a median of seven companies. And for asthma, 23 of 24 experts were paid by a median of six uh, companies. And I also wanna stress that I am not saying that researchers who, have, uh, who are paid by the pharmaceutical industries are, are bad or uh, bad, bad persons or <laughs> have, have bad agendas or anything like that. But I see absolutely no reason why people with uh, financial conflicts of interest should decide should be on on guideline panels. Uh, there's that, that seems totally illogical to me. And I know that when when this this is discussed, people often say that if we would have that uh, that criteria for guideline panels, then we would have very huge difficulties to get content area experts uh, because so many are are paid by the pharmaceutical industry in some way, one way or the other. Uh, and maybe that's true, but if it's true, then that should be like a big warning sign, right? If we can't find one uh, endocrinologist who does not, he's not paid by pharmaceutical industry to be on a guideline panel, that's, that's sort of uh, something that we should uh, uh, address, I think. Okay, so the next cloud is vested interest. Okay, so guidelines put patients and clinicians in a terrible situation by recommending many, many times more stuff than we actually have the possibility to do. And one would think that such recommendations would at least be uh, supported by a strong evidence base, uh, but that is rarely the case. In this iconic paper from 2005, John Ioannidis, a professor from Stanford, states that it can be proven that most claimed research findings are false. He says that the research finding is less likely to be true. Uh, the smaller the studies conducted within a scientific field, the smaller the effect sizes, and the greater the number and the lesser the selection of tested relationships, the greater the flexibility in designs, definitions, outcomes, and analytical models. Um, in a scientific field. And there, that's where reporting guidelines and core outcome sets becomes uh, um, quite important, I think. Uh, also, the, of course, the greater the finan financial and other interests and prejudices in a, in a scientific field. And also the hotter scientific fields with more scientific teams involved, which increases the risk of false positives. In this study uh, published in Science, they replicated 100 published studies within psychology. So they basically just did the same studies as the published ones, uh, and they found that on average, the beneficial effect dropped by 50%, and the proportion of statistically significant results dropped from 97 to 36%. And in uh, this study, they compared published data compared to unpublished data for SSRIs for depression, 
and they found that 31% of the studies were not published. Um, of the studies with positive results, 97% were publish, published. Of the studies with negative or inconclusive results, 61% were not published. 31% were published as positive, so the authors had twisted the, uh, the results to appear positive, uh, uh, that the drug was beneficial. Uh, but the FDA uh, judged, the American um, Medical Agency judged uh, the study to actually be negative or inconclusive. And only 8% uh, were published as negative. And this is a network meta-analysis of antidepressants uh, recently published in The Lancet. So I don't know, can you see when I point with this one? Yeah. It, so this, each of these is a different antidepressant uh, and each of these are different uh, point estimates and, and confidence interval for, for the different drugs. So each of these is one meta-analysis. And as you can see, all of the drugs had a statistically significant beneficial effect uh, which you can see because they don't, the confidence intervals don't cross the line of no effect, which is this line. So the authors uh, concluded that undertreated depression is a huge problem, and we need to be aware of that. We tend to focus on overtreatment, but we need to focus on this. And this meta analysis finally puts to end the controversy of antidepressants. And the. Uh, what happened? Uh, the public media went uh, were a little bit more more uh, extreme or sexy in their uh, communication. More people should get pills to beat depression. Millions of sufferers would benefit. Doctors told. So this, but these results could also be expressed in in, in other ways. Um, for example, minimal clinically important difference according to NICE, the UK uh, guideline um, organization, is 0 0.5 standardized mean difference. In this meta-analysis, the effect was 0 0.3 SMD. And as James McCormack said, uh, wrote in the BMJ, if 10 patients with moderate to severe depression get SSRIs for, five, for two months, five of them will have an improvement on the Hamilton scheme. Uh, but for four of them, this is not because of SSRI. They would have had the same improvement without treatment. And again, I am not saying that we should not use SSRIs. Uh, this is just to prove uh, prove another point. <laughs> uh, in this systematic review of studies comparing reporting of harm in published versus unpublished data uh, of the same studies, they found that 43 to 100% of adverse events were not published. So in conclusion, uh, the evidence base on which our guidelines are based is most often the top of an iceberg. And on a closer look, the snow on the iceberg is uh, often quite dirty and not that shiny and white as it looks from the, from the distance. And I really believe that the authors uh, should be much, much, much more humble to this fact because it's often very, very difficult to, to, um, uh, to see through uh, the huge potential biases with the evidence base. Uh, so the next dark cloud is an overconfidence in flawed evidence in the flawed evidence base. As uh, Ronolfo was uh, talking about, um, uh, I will now get into multimorbidity. Most research underpinning our guidelines are based on people with a single condition, while in reality, most of our patients have many chronic conditions. This is a study based on the same population as the previous slide I showed on cardiovascular disease risk with the red wave of, <laughs> of risk uh, going through the population. And in this study, the authors found that almost 50% of the adult Norwegian population fulfill the traditional criteria for multimorbidity, which is two or more chronic uh, conditions. Again, this is one of the healthiest and most long living populations in the world. So you could claim that this is a medical artifact, but, but still they have more, more than one uh, chronic condition. But yet for some reason that I have difficulties understand, um, guidelines seem to pretend that most people have only one condition. This is a study of NICE guidelines, again, the UK uh, guideline organization, um, and they took 
three index condition, diabetes type two, depression and heart failure. And then they cross-linked them to 11 other conditions with the most common in, in primary care. Uh, and the authors found that uh, for diabetes two, type two, this rendered 32 potentially serious drug disease interactions and 133 potentially serious drug, uh, drug interactions and so on for the rest of the conditions. But as most of you I think know is there's often little or no help at all to guide us on how to, how to deal with this in the guidelines. And I think there's actually, I mean, this is, it, it is difficult to, to rethink this. Uh, it, would, it would take to reform how guidelines are done, but it is possible and it is absolutely vital that we do it because currently most guidelines are absolutely useless uh, for most patients that we meet. And that seems quite unacceptable to me. Uh, so I think we just need to dare to think outside of the box. Yeah, guidelines are organized in, in silos. That's the problem. It's organ per organ, and it fits the organization, the traditional organization of the healthcare system, but it doesn't fit the patients very well because most patients have multiple organs and, and they end up uh, in between the silos. Um, okay, so how many times have I heard this as a GP? Uh, I don't know if you heard, hear it as often as internal medicine doctors, but as a GP, I, we hear it a lot. <laughs> you are not good enough at following evidence-based uh, guidelines. And I agree, I think most doctors are not very well up to date on the evidence base, but it's not so easy when the guidelines are based on young, young healthy, extremely fit white men and our patients does not fit the box. This is Ulla and Fredrik, who is the organizers of the, <laughs> of the symposium, if you missed it. Uh, okay, so the next, next cloud, and I, this idea for the slide is from Margaret Thomas Dotter, an Icelandic researcher. Um, so the next cloud is uh, the extremely destructive silo thinking uh, permeating medicine at large. It's not only a problem for guidelines, but I think guidelines could potentially be uh, a Part of the solution instead of a part of the problem. Back to the tsunami. How much time do I have? One could say that a solution to the massive mismatch in what is being recommended and the available resources to provide the recommended intervention is to have more doctors or more healthcare personnel, which means to spend more money on, on healthcare. And as Frederick pointed out this morning, this is indeed what is happening. Um, of course, there are many reasons to this with more advanced treatments that are very expensive uh, and so on. But the fact is that we spend more and more of our money on healthcare, and every dollar spent on healthcare is a dollar that could be used to something else like schools, education, or other societal uh, sectors. So if our goal is to improve public health, health is an increased spending on healthcare rational? Screening for lung cancer is estimated to sell, save 12,000 of approximately 160,000 deaths from lung cancer every year in the US. At the same time, public interventions to decrease smoking is estimated to save 160,000 deaths in the US every year. And that is 10 times as many as screening for, for lung cancer. And the public interventions are also uh, cheaper and has much less risk of harms for individuals such as overdiagnosis and, and overtreatment. This is, of course, not an easy question. It's an ideological uh, question. How much should society interfere with individuals with smoking bans and, and stuff like that? And I'm not saying that I have the answer to that or I'm, that I'm the person that should answer that. But when recommending uh, expensive interventions within healthcare, I think we must start considering the opportunity costs on a societal level. Are there other ways uh, to, do, to increase public health uh, which, should be, which are better or more effective or, or, or more rational, cause less harm and more benefit? Also, I am not saying that lung cancer screening should not be implemented. <laughs> That's, uh, I'm trying to make another point here. This is a graph from Michael Marmot, who did a big report for the UK government in 2010, the Marmot Review. Um, so this graph shows life expectancy and disability-free life ex expectancies in neighborhoods um, uh, by, by neighborhood income deprivation. 
So in summary, the poorer you are, the shorter you live and the healthier and the, the sicker you are while you live. And the richer you are, the longer you live and the healthier you are while you live. And the effect of this is far bigger uh, than we can achieve with any intervention within healthcare. And Michael Marmot says, uh, the key determin determinants of health are not what happens within healthcare. Health is determined not so much by what doctors do for patients, but by arrangements in society. And this is what I mean with the streetlight effect. Uh, we spend more and more money on healthcare, while the major determinant determinants of health is outside the cone of the streetlight. Uh, it's in the dark. And Mike, Michael Marmot also says, for every dollar spent on early child development, you save $7 over the life course because children with better early child development are less likely to end up delinquent, involved in crime, and unemployed, and so on. Again, I, I, this claim is based on loads of, loads of research, but again, I understand this is political issues, uh, uh, but something that needs to be considered uh, uh, because we take so much money in healthcare. So, okay, so the next cloud, uh, an inability to prioritize societal resources. And now to the last and my favorite uh, cloud on the guideline, <laughs> heaven. Uh, so I get the feeling, as a, as a general practitioner, I get the feeling that guidelines assumes that my consultation looks like this, like a long line uh, of straight, straight line with straight problems. Uh, that could be dealt with one by one. Uh, and in each of these three tree tops, there's like a guideline that perhaps even a decision aid that helps me facilitate shared decision making. Uh, and in this forest, current guidelines make perfect sense, uh, right? But the problem is that my consultations feel a lot more like this, like a wildwood, like full of rabbit holes and, uh, and fallen trees and in this forest, it's very difficult to know which tree I should climb, like which, which are the guidelines that are relevant in this forest and who decide which guidelines are relevant. Where I see blood pressure and depression, uh, the patient might see a very different problem. And if we focus on, on if we try to fit forest like this into uh, the the other forest, then we might end up what's important, we might risk losing what's important for the patient. And I think that's totally unacceptable um, because guidelines should be a place for patients and clinicians to turn to when it makes sense to draw information from the available evidence to help solve a problem. But guidelines should never define uh, the problem. So the last cloud, uh, the risk that guidelines counteract patient patient-centeredness. Luckily, there are lots of brilliant people around the world that has been working hard with improving guidelines for a long time. Uh, I'm sure you all have heard of GRADE and um, the evidence to decision framework, uh, which is, I think, a really great and massive improvement. Um, the evidence to decision framework is basically a set of domains and signaling questions that help guideline panels consider relevant factors, and also uh, transparently report how they made their judgments, which is very important, I think. And even I think, even though I think this is absolutely brilliant, uh, I, th I still think there is room for improvement, uh, perhaps especially in, in consideration to horizontal prioritization of human and financial resources. And that's also why I'm so happy to, to say that we are uh, forming a GRADE working group. So it's a collaboration between Cochrane Sustainable Healthcare and, and GRADE on how to tackle medical excess in, in uh, guideline development. So in conclusion, in my opinion, uh, to stay relevant, guidelines need to move from transparency to independence of vested interests. So it's not enough to declare your uh, conflicts of interest. The, the guideline panels should be without conflicts of interest. We also need to be much more humble to the inherent uncertainty of scientific uh, evidence, so the top of the iceberg. And we should start from the perspective of the patient and not from the organization of the healthcare system. We need to break the silos. We also need to find ways to help instead of hinder patients and healthcare personnel prioritize human and financial resources. So we need to stop the tsunami. 
And we need to counteract harms to public health from irrational spending of community resources on the healthcare sector, the streetlight effect. So that was all, thank you. Thank you so much, Mina, for this uh, very nice overview uh, with a lot of uh, provocative uh, uh, components uh, and very eye-opening as well. I think, I mean, um, let, let's, uh, uh, I was thinking, just like uh, Professor Montano said that, uh, I mean, in the case of screening, it's not about not screening, but it's to find that uh, right balanced uh, red line of where to do or not to do. So, and, and you, you, you already evoked a, a little bit of a chat debate here um, between uh, Peter Nilsson and, and Anders Hernberg on, on when, which hypertensive patients do you treat and not. And I, th I think they both agree that in this case, it's determined by the total cardiovascular risk. But let me put uh, the co comment or question this way, that if, if, if you have a, a, a cardiovascular risk assessment and you, um, you find that some person have um, a, a high risk, let's say 15 or 20 percent 10 year risk, so according to the guidelines, you should go in and treat here uh, the risk factors. So what, what would make you do it differently? Let's say, I mean, I, I, I guess you were pointing out that you, you, you need to look at all the diseases and the conditions and, and look at the patient as a whole. And how do we do that and still, um, um, uh, still let's say, respecting the guidelines or should we just give up the guidelines? Because then you're down to like a personal... Uh, personal uh, judgment based on the meeting mm. with the patient which which might is the which might be the right thing but what, what how how do you deal with this in your uh, practice well, i think i think it's i think it's a little bit two different questions like uh, if if it's if you ask from the individual perspective like for me as a gp in my clinical practice i have you know, in my practice we have 2000 patients per full time gp and I think it becomes absolutely clear to all of us working as GPs at my practice that if we use all, the, if we follow the guidelines for cardiovascular risk, then we can take care of, of those patients with, in, in, of, the, of those, those 2,000 patients, but we don't have the time to follow up uh, the 50-year man with suicidal thoughts or, or do a swift uh, rectoscopy on, on someone with, with a suspicion of, of colorectal cancer. So, I mean, you have to, uh, I think it, there's no other, the way that guidelines are done today, there is no other way for clinicians than to not follow the recommendations. And that's a shame because it's on the other end is this uh, cynical, uh, whatever, I do what, what I want, I don't need to follow the evidence. So, and that's, and that's a shame because that's not, definitely not good either. I mean, I am not arguing for that <laughs> attitude. So, so from, but from a clinical perspective, the guidelines today give us no other choice than to ignore a lot of the recommendations. And that's terrible, I think. So I, but, but I think the solution, I mean, the solution for when I supervise uh, 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 GP residents, I, I try to help them like what, understand what's the most important thing to do and stuff like that. But, but that leaves, that, that is sort of my point with this talk also, that this, mis, this huge mismatch in recommendation and the available resources to do so, that leaves so much in the hands of every clinicians. And it's, it's, it opens up this uh, door to, to build your decisions on prejudices and, and uh, flawed evidence. So I think that's, that's a part of the problem. And when we talk about uh, what what should happen in guidelines? I think I mean it's it's difficult, of course, uh, but you could I mean it, it would be so much to ask that the guidelines would do a, an analysis of the consequences of their recommendations. Like it wouldn't it would take like a very quick back of the envelope uh, estimate from these cardiovascular guidelines that I talked about on the on one of the first slides to find, to see that, okay, this is unreasonable, that this is impossible for the clinicians or the patients to do. So maybe we should rethink this. Uh, but today there are no such uh, 
I mean, th these kind of estimates are not included in cost effectiveness analysis and, and stuff like that. It could be, I think it could be quite easily done, uh, but it would take the, um, the, the will to, to do it. So I don't know if that's an answer to the question, but, but I think it's, I, I mean, I think the solution, if, I, if it was up to me to decide, <laughs> I think the solution would be that the guideline panels was in, were independent from conflicts of interest uh, that they had a broad representation of uh, not only generalists, uh, but also patient representatives and the public and um, ex experts in social sciences and stuff like that. Um, and that they that each guideline did a consequential analysis, what would happen if the recommendations was fully implemented. And if it turns out that the recommendations would crush the healthcare system, then they would do another recommendation. That's, that's my opinion. Thank you. We, we had another question. Uh, comment slash question on uh, from Peter Nilsson on uh, the polypill strategy in um, in in uh, low to medium risk patients uh, in in I guess cardiovascular prevention as well uh, mm. to be distributed over the counter provided that this evidence is strong enough so so uh, as a way to spare time for the GP what do you think about this? I think it's, I think it's difficult to to uh, to answer the question. Uh, first of all, I think I think that the social determinants of health would be perhaps better to focus on, uh, I, or I think that the evidence to, today suggests that that kind of focus would have bigger impact on public health. But if we only talk about the polypill and and this idea of not of sort of democratizing <laughs> med medicine so that people could choose by themselves and, and the doctors weren't involved in it. I think, I mean, what we hear today as GPs is that, okay, so it's a, it's a tight, tight balance between benefits and harms. So what you need to do for, for people with low or moderate risk. So what you need to, need to do then is to take the time to make a shared decision making with the patient. And I could easily spend all my time for my 2000, uh, the, for the population of 2000 on uh, talking about benefits and harms of, of uh, hypertensive treatment or cardiovascular disease treatment in people with low to moderate risk. Uh, but I don't want that because I want to take care of people with potential cancer and, and depression and stuff like that. So I think, I think there are, I think it's a difficult question. I don't want to answer yes or no, but I think it's an interesting idea to, to, uh, to take it away from, from healthcare. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an uh, interesting theme. Theme to think about it like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, w I was a little bit uh, struck by the slide that you had, not only on the one on me and Ulle and the cat, <laughs> but also on the, uh, <laughs> on on. Uh, well, th there was a, a previous uh, Secretary of Defense in the United States called Donald Rumsfeld. And he wrote a lot of memos, and one of the memos was that it's easy to know what you know, and, and if you don't know what you know, uh, stuff like that. The hardest thing is to not know what you not don't know. And one of the slides that you had was that a lot of the studies that are negative are not published, and they don't mm -hmm. find their way into the journals. And the journals, they make up most of what is then drawn into the guidelines. So there is a publication bias within the journals as I understand it, what, how do we how do we how do we tackle that problem when most studies are positive? Yeah, when they're positive. So I, th I mean, I think it's uh, there are lots of stuff going on, of course, like you know, like the uh, trial registra registration, so that it, everyone doing a, a clinic, uh, randomized controlled trial has to register the protocol before, uh, but it isn't working optimally <laughs> because many of the many of the trials published in the great in the biggest medical journals are still not still don't have a, a protocol published uh, pre-published or or they in the protocol they actually uh, don't report the outcomes that they said they were going to report so they do selective reporting anyway uh, but i think but what what's happening also and what's going on a lot in cochrane is that uh, more and more of this of the cochrane reviews uh, should be based on on the, the um, what is it called like the, the clinical study reports and the, the actual data from the trials uh, 
the raw data uh, from the trial. So it's not the published material because everything that is published is also very, very short uh, summaries of, of what has been going on in a trial. And I think that could be done for some of the major issues, uh, but for many, for many, it's it's more difficult. But but I think also, I mean, there are it's it's a lot of things that could be done in, in this area, which would take lots of resources. There are also people discussing that actually the, the last clinical trials should not be done by the pharmaceutical industry at all. Instead, it should be uh, by independent units. And that might happen in, in 10 to 20 years, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, <laughs> we, we can't lose our hope, right? But anyway, I think in the, in the beginning, where we are now, we just have to realize that even if something seems very clear, we most of the times we don't know for sure. So we shouldn't be so, uh, it, we shouldn't be so absolute too certain that what we think is true is, is true because it could be uh, the other way around. So yeah, more, more humility uh, to the evidence base, I would say. Okay. Thank you very much, um, uh, Minna. And I would like to thank all the, the speakers of this uh, first session of, of, of the symposium for great talks. And um, um, now we are going to um, close for a lunch break that unfortunately we cannot mingle together, but you have to mingle with your colleagues or uh, close family or wherever you are sitting. And we will, we will be back in an hour from now, so one uh, fifteen or 13.15 local time, uh, Central European time in Sweden if you are elsewhere. So uh, uh, many thanks to, to, to the speakers and for everyone who has listened, and we will reconvene at 1.15 uh, p.m. Thank you.